Welcome, everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges. As he explores turning the page on his life and yours. Hey, Charlie. Hey, Paul. Boy, let me tell you, we are in for a real treat today. I have already spent nearly three hours of discussion regarding your artistic identity with our very special guest, Dr. Stephanie Allen. My problem today is not regarding what I want to talk about, but what I have to leave out, because Stephanie has so much wisdom to share. Stephanie Allen holds a doctorate in musical arts from the University of Minnesota. She teaches violin to students of all ages in her school, Violin Technique Coaching. But Stephanie's expertise is not exclusively regarding violin or music in general. She teaches anyone how to bring your inherent art form out of that hiding place within. She, and she is a master at her craft. Stephanie says she is committed to preserving both the artist and the art. And I like this is what, what she writes. Catch this. Music is in my DNA. I have a beautiful lineage of musicians in my family. But the art of mastery is not something you can inherit. It is something, it is a path that is studied practiced, learned, and explored. It is an intentional path. And often the art of mastery is a path that is wrought with pain, fear, performance, anxiety, and abuse. It is not an easy road. But uh, Stephanie is here to help us master this path. And she has developed a brilliant methodology for teaching violin and for helping artists in general how to thrive in their art. And oh, by the way, Stephanie believes that every single one of us possesses an artist within. We'll talk about that. So with that, let's bring on Stephanie Allen to the show. Dr. Stephanie Allen, welcome to the next chapter with Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have you. We have we have had the longest pre-podcast conversations I've had with anybody, just because there's so much content. You are amazing with the content that you have to share. I can't wait for you to share it with our audience. Okay, so maybe why don't we begin with um, you giving us a brief understanding of your experience as an artist with uh, with a mastery of violin. I know you're a classical performer, a teacher, and a student with a doctorate. Um, tell me tell me more so so we get an eye we get a picture of of Stephanie Allen. I really cannot remember a time where I didn't have a violin in my hands. So it's really part of my earliest memories. It's, um, it's grown with me, it's grown up with me, and it's been a part of me um, since I was about three or four. So I have um, musical parents, music teachers as parents, they're not string players, but they really understood how to provide me with opportunities and training and structure and support. Um, they were and are very loving coaches and I feel very lucky to have had them as parents and to grow up with music um, from early on though I do remember music and learning it was was something we took very seriously so it wasn't a hobby once I chose my instrument and I did have a choice I got to choose violin then it was all in and that was like early on, you know, investing daily 30 to 45 minutes, sometimes an hour in the study and of the instrument. And learning from what age? Lesson. From about three to four is when I started. Seriously. You know, that time grew as I grew. Um, you know, so maybe those early years were half hour a day, but it was, it was very, it was just woven into my life. It was, I loved it. I uh, learned how to work through challenge and really master it. And I continued all the way through. 
all the way through my undergrad. I did music education for my undergrad, and then I really focused on violin in my master's and in my doctorate. And loved it all the way. The, the process of learning has been, it has its ups and downs, of course. So I didn't always love the process of the learning, but I loved the music, and I feel very lucky and blessed to call this my passion and my work. It's, it's both. That is so fortunate. That That's wonderful. And so with your history, you know, and, and, and as the listeners will find out later, you're, you have a very unique approach to, not only unique, but brilliant approach to learning music. And, and it is very different than what is common out there, is it not? Do you not have sort of a, a sort of a unique and idiosyncratic way of doing your it, your teaching? In my experience, I, I didn't find this way of learning until my doctorate. And I could sense I had holes in my learning. I went on a, a bit of a quest to find the right teacher to help me fill in those goals and to help me with this sequence of learning, specifically for violin. And it was just through my life circumstances that I found so many different healing modalities outside of violin for healing and um, in therapy and then other healing modalities, modalities as well. And through that happened to be going on at the same time as my doctorate. And so I just naturally find, found myself blending the two and playing with the two and seeing how I was growing personally through therapy and through personal development, working on the being side of an artist. And then I was growing by leaps and bounds as I was going back to the foundations of violin, um, finding all the cracks and all the holes, filling those in and then building strong foundation and then really filling in the entire technical development of the violin side by side and they just happened to complement each other beautifully and that is where my teaching method began and that's where you know it comes in where you talk about and we'll talk about this probably much later toward the end of the podcast but i want to talk about being and doing and and you're talking about the doing is the mastery is is the techniques that you're using but the being that sounds like that has a lot to do with your healing modalities and and how you deal with your a dangerous and scary inner voice that doesn't want you to succeed. Would would I understand that correctly? Yes, absolutely. It it really does allow it allows you to be a healthy musician all around. So the study, the commitment, the dedication to the art presents the integrity of the art and the instrument. And then the uh, the focus on developing the character and the belief systems and understanding what I would call remembering who you are as an artist, that allows you to sustain your love of the art, of the instrument, of the process of learning, helps you engage with the challenge. And in my experience, it just brings so much joy to the process. And if I'm talking, um, on the performance side, it actually is an accelerator for understanding and learning and synthesis. So it does have a performance aspect to it that is quantifiable. But aside from that, the joy of the art and the way we, we create the art and present it has a profound impact. And it can be felt by the audience, but I think more importantly, by the artist. Yeah, and you know, you talked about, I think you talked about the integrity of the art. Does that have anything to do with what you know, what we are calling, because when, I think I'm titling this show Discovering Your Artistic Identity. Does that, does that have anything to do with an artistic identity? The integrity of the art and the integrity of the art 
in harmony with the integrity of your inner core? I think so. From my experience, the loudest and the strongest critics were within, in my own Oh, and, yes. And they would, they would come out in, in critiques. As musicians, we have auditions, we have competitions, we have assessments, we have in university settings, we have juries, we get graded, we get picked apart, we get analyzed. That's a necessary part of the learning process, the analysis of the art. And what what I found was I, I did not have a sequential technical foundation to my learning. So my reading, for instance, my reading had gaps in it at a young age. And so I would not have characterized myself as a strong reader. So I couldn't learn my material fast enough to keep up with the demands of the industry um, and be able to to perform it flawlessly, which is what the industry demands for success. And so I, I would, that would cause me a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety. And then it would cause me to look within and say, what's wrong with me? I must be this and this and this, which were all characteristics of despair. <laughs> and I must be, I must be behind. I must be uh, lacking in some way. Must not be able to to do this in order to keep up or win that audition or win that competition. And so there was a real aspect of if I listened to inside, I listened to those critics. There was an aspect of truth for sure. I had gaps, and once I started filling those gaps in with this beautiful. Um, regimen that starts at the very beginning and really develops the full artistic development and technical development of these, I started feeling confident. And I could quiet those critics inside. And then I started seeing the, the assessments on the outside, you know, in my, in my auditions, in my lessons, in my recitals. They were lining up too. And then being able to, and I see that as a, a separate thing than the, uh, what I would call artistic identity, um, that is more so the, the being of the artist. And so I do see the artistic development, the technical development is just as important as the internal uh, awareness of the artist. And then you learn how to integrate them together so that they work together as a team to really produce a powerfully strong, happy musician. You know, don't don't you think we live in a culture that really, especially in art, seems not to respect the mastery, the technical mastery that you advocate, that you say once you are a technical master, then, then you can you have a basis to be creative and we're and and we're we're so into this intuitive creative whatever comes to whatever the muse speaks to you you go out and 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 perform according to the muse but but you suggest bringing us back to the basics and that that if you don't have the technical part mastered you you're 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 going to be very limited in what you can do creatively I appreciate that, and I, I, I don't think I've really ever heard anybody say that, you know, in the creative sphere. They, you know, creative, there's this false notion is that creative starts out of nowhere, but it, it starts from a, a very foundational basis that you can do certain things really well over and over and over again, and... Isn't that one of the things that you that you preach that you that you really advocate with your students? That is absolutely one of my favorite things to highlight in the learning process. I love to explain it like an elevator. This isn't a perfect perfect analogy, but it is a helpful one. I hope. Okay. And 
as a student learns in the elevator, it's, it's like a training ground. They are learning, they're, they're struggling, they're risking, they're failing. They're, they're being introduced to the tools, the foundational tools of reading, of posture, of specifically violin. I highlight four different languages they're learning. And they're learning at a, at a rate and a pace that matches their own learning style and their own motivation pace. And so there's, there's so many things happening inside that elevator, so to speak. And the more tools that they're given, how to hold the bow, how to hold the instrument, how to produce the sound and play in tune so that it's... Yeah, and, it, and that all makes a huge difference. It all makes a huge difference. And so we're setting up the stage, so to speak. We're giving, giving I, I will be giving the, the child the opportunity and the tools at a pace and a sequence that their brain can really metabolize and their body can really synthesize. And so let's say they accumulate a certain amount of techniques and then I have 11 levels in my, in my technical. In your elevator? In my elevator. 11, 11 floors, floors in your elevator. And so I always say, if you learn everything in that first level of learning, when you get out of the elevator, you can play, you can create, you can improvise with the tools that you have. So they don't know they're limited because they only know what they know. They're just allowed to have fun and there's tons of music that they can explore and enjoy and present and share and learn at that level so i, I feel like the creative playground is accessible even on level one and then we go back in and we learn and learn and learn and you can get off the elevator anytime you want you know you can play um that's what i would call the repertoire the music so we're learning in our technique books, we're learning the skills, we're learning how to build, learn, break down music, and then um, bring it all together and present it. And then level two, you have a whole another level of music and what I would call a playground. Go play, go enjoy yourself, go enjoy the music, share it. And so they're learning how to learn, but they're also learning how to play and enjoy it. And, and they're learning something they can practice that they can go back to when they're when they're struggling that you go back to you need at some point to be able to go back to the basics and rehearse the basics and say was my was my body position correct was I holding the bow correctly was I you know I'm, I'm sorry I, I don't know of any other examples but that those must be practiced all the time and and evaluated all the time you, you know, you know an interesting story that you reminded me of is a story of, I don't know, you you may be too young to to remember this, but John Wooden, the UCLA basketball coach that won more NCAA titles than anybody else, and um, he, I, I think, you know, what did he win, Paul? Like seven in a row, or eight in a row. I mean, it's just you know unheard of, you know, just an unheard of, and it was all his coaching. And do you know what he did? He spent his 90 minutes, his first practice, with he's, he's recruited all of these brilliant high school players. They're known for as being phenoms. And you know what he spent the first 90 minutes of practice on? Tying their shoes. Oh, my. 90 minutes on tying your shoes because if your shoes are not tied correctly, you can sprain an ankle, you can get a sore foot, you can get blisters, and then you're out for weeks or, you know, days. And so, so you know, you talk about going to the basics. I think, you know, in basketball, probably the basic you can get is tying your shoes. But that sounds to me like much of what you're doing is that you're teaching people to tie their shoes. That is very true. I want the students as, as young as three and four to have the tools to be able to help themselves. So what I would call independent learning. A lot of traditional music teaching creates a codependent relationship. The teacher needs the student 
to perform a certain way or to compete a certain way in order for that teacher to validate the student to validate the teacher to validate the teacher and the other way around the student becomes dependent on the teacher for all the learning and all the solutions and for validation and for motivation and for commitment and discipline and I, I don't see that as being sustainable or healthy in the long run. So, yeah, giving the students early on the tools for independence, but I also believe in the power of choice as the most powerful motivator. So allowing the child over time to be able to choose more and more, it also allows me to assess where they're at in the learning process to see what tools they're reaching for within their levels because they only, like I said, they only know what they know. So I'm going to be seeing what are they reaching for to help them solve their own problems, to help them assess and be aware of their own their own success or the, the places where they need to go back to the basics and fix the bow hole, play more in tune, reach for the tuner, reach for the metronome. It's all built in. Let me, let me, you know, kind of move along to a little bit different of a topic in that, in that I want to talk to you about my brother-in-law, who is a, um, who mixes music, he plays guitar, he sings, and he mixes music, and truly, you know, I'm, I'm sort of a music snob, and that I know enough about music to be dangerous, I can't play anything, but I, I have a good ear, and this guy is good. He's really good. He doesn't make garbage. He makes he makes he makes good music. Now, you know, would it sell? I I have no idea. You know, that's a whole different game. Um, it, it has very little to do with how good you are, and and more to do with who you know and uh, what audience you bring to the table. But you know, there is there is something that that. You had talked about, and I had read in your website. Your your website, by the way, is incredible. It's really a brilliant website. You talked about the imposter syndrome, and so many people look at my brother-in-law because you know he can. He'll take a job at 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 Home Depot, or he'll tin bar, or he'll serve, he service. But what he wants to do is be in a mixing room. And he wants to be mixing music, and that's all he cares about doing, is mix, mixing, mixing music. And family and a lot of people look at him as flaky, out of touch, he needs to get into reality, he needs to understand that he needs to get a degree and get his job doing... But it's not in his heart, and, and you write about the in, imposter syndrome. Is, is that something like the imposter syndrome? I would probably want to explore more about why he creates art, more of uh, what what he fears and what he loves. Because I feel like the imposter syndrome is is many things, but it is kind of is it can often be, I should say, a surrender to certain fears and a uh, fear of failure, a hope, a fear of success, or fear of looking foolish, a uh, fear of risk. Um, so there's, there's, that's just in a couple. And so there are, there are fears to be explored in, in my, in my opinion, fears to be explored and then ways to shift actions and attitudes to support the greater goal. And that's where I would start to explore uh, what am I afraid of and let's name it all, identify if they are actual fears, such as, wow, I need to, I need to go back to school and, and get some more education because I've got some gaps. That was my fear. I, I had my master's. I was on paper ready for my career, but there was this nagging, this nagging imposter syndrome inside. You're not ready. You're not ready. 
And I had to explore that. What am I afraid of? I'm, I'm going to be afraid of being found out that I don't know X, Y, and Z. So then, actions and attitudes. All right, I want to confront that. I want to go slay that giant, and I'm going to go back to school, and I'm going to answer that, that fear with some hard data and get those answers. So that when that comes creeping back in, I can say, you know, I've got my answers. And I can answer that and pop the syndrome with some legit. You mentioned something about about these these uh, the fears and the giants, and I I, I want to go on to your topic about um, invisible giants. But uh, what I want to do is before we get there, can we take a brief break and we'll be right back. Hi there, this is Charlie Hedges, and you're listening to The Next Chapter with Charlie and my special guest, Dr. Stephanie Allen, who is, as you will find out, such a creative teacher of the arts, especially music and the violin, but she deals with all arts. She brings up, she. we were just talking about a point of one of our greatest obstacles to succeeding at our art or 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 delivering performing showing uh shipping our art is fear and you would talk to me about um invisible giants and that are and and fear was just one of them can you can you talk to me more about the invisible giants that seem to be blockades to our I don't want to use the word success, but to our our uh, ability to produce that which gives us great joy. I would love to talk about that. These are these are either real and present, or they could also be like haunting, haunting phrases or identities that we've held onto in the past. Maybe I've talked to. I talked to highly trained professionals where they will say, at one lesson when I was 16 years old, a teacher told me, I don't have what it takes to be a professional violinist. And that has haunted me ever since. I've had others say that they received other, other harmful coaching in the past or perhaps a devastating experience with an audition or a competition that has really impacted them. I would call those giants to confront. And that could be feelings of despair or or vulnerability. I would also say um, if I'm feeling aversion or a, or a loathing or yes, you know, you mentioned to me sadness and disgust and fear, and I told you, will you stop your list because you're defining me? It's so much a part of who we are in our performance-oriented culture that that has strange metrics that are very different than the metrics you look at, and and very few of us can live up to the met- metrics of the American dream. And so we have these, I like your word, invisible giants. And don't you have like something like a feeling wheel that, that identifies these and you, you help your, your students work through that process? I do. When they sense resistance of any kind in the learning process, I call those the giants, and we get curious. And we take out the feeling wheel. There are so many online. I just order stickers, and they each have one. And we start in the middle of the wheel, and I say, okay, I can see that your, you know, maybe the child will start to cry, or they're discovering the edge 
of their of their potential of their of their skill set and I'm I'm really trying to push the edge, help them discover that for themselves and they, they start to to show their emotions are starting to turn towards sadness or anger or frustration. So we'll pause. I'll say, Okay, I can see can see that you're having a lot of feelings right now. Would you like to take out your feeling wheel and write down three or four of them that you're feeling? And they'll write down, let's say, yes, anger, mad, um, insecure, and anxious. And so then they'll talk about that. Okay, why are you anxious? And they're anxious that they'll never get this particular section of the piece. They're insecure because they keep failing. They're mad at themselves because they should know better in their own mind. They might be feeling angry because they're tired. <laughs> and yeah. then we'll talk about those. And then I'll say, all right, how would you like to interact with those? And then we'll move over to so the challenge. We'll move over to the compassion side. And I'll say, what would you like to reach for to help yourself? So let's say it's a particular piece of music that's challenging. They'll say, I think I could help myself by slowing down the tempo and perhaps taking the bow away and just feeling the notes of my fingertips as I say this. Hmm. And, and right there, they've just created a situation where there is no longer chaos. They're not feeling out of control. I think, you know, they're able to center themselves back into this calm and what I would say king or queen energy. They have a plan based on the tools that they've been taught, they're using them. They have just mapped out a path of success and mastery. They do that and all of a sudden, their whole demeanor changes and they do another feeling check but they they were able to go back through that passage successfully because they were able to slow themselves down add a tool of help of compassion the metronome <laughs> and these other different things you know they check in what are you feeling now and okay i'm feeling really powerful based on the feeling right here i'm feeling confident I'm thinking of your class. Is this is this a one-on-one, -on -one or is everybody in the class participating in this process? One-on-one. One-on-one. -on -one. So it is complete. Mm -hmm. It is tailored to the moment, to the student, to the season. You know what? I, I want you to tell us a story that you told me because you had opportunity to work with a student who could not memorize music because she was a victim of seizures. And she was told by physicians that she could not memorize music, therefore she couldn't get her degree. Wasn't that the the goal she was trying to get her degree? Yes. And tell us, tell us, because I think that's I think that's fascinating. I think what it is is you you know you were able to take a very emotional, a very invisible giant, you know, a huge, you know, a huge giant in her life. And you were able to use a whole different process than I think psychiatrists and psychologists would use. Uh, tell us about that story because I think that's it. I found that to be a very fascinating story about this person. It's happened in my doctorate, and while I was still testing all of this, it was it was my dissertation. It was my, and I, it was still in process, and I was testing it and. The faculty said, you know what, um, we're not sure what to do here, and we've exhausted our options. Would you like to teach her and see if, if, if you can help her? And I said, absolutely. And I sat down with her on our first lesson and asked her, well, what was your first exposure? Why do you love it? Why do you want this degree? Do you want it? What are you afraid of? What are your fears in losing this opportunity? What are your fears in your um, in your claim? What do you what do you feel that you're lacking in order to attain your your degree? And then I said, okay, I, I can see that you want this, and you're committed 
to the process here, would you be willing to to trust me? And I will I will help you as best as I absolutely can, but I think there's a way here to do this. And she said, yes, I'm willing to try anything. It's, it's all or nothing. And so we went to where she felt most insecure in her technical development. In her technical development, there, not in her, in not in her, her development. emotional development, but in her technical development. Correct. We went to the technical side first, and I broke it down to the very, very basics of, of the rhythm of the piece, of the, of how to hold, how to synthesize, how to play it, and to gave her those those tools so that she started to feel more and more confident and accepting and full and all these joyful and, and curious and all of these really positive energies and then started what I would call watering watering her with affirmation and this is not flattery it's, it's not flattery it is, it is honest affirmation of this artist a lot of quick results can happen in a high performing art with, with shame and with pressure and with um, harshness and just uh, on an instructor that can yield results but I choose not to do that uh, I would work with her schedule I would teach her how to practice in the most efficient way technically but then also how to talk to herself in the process when she was feeling frustrated because she would shut down when she was feeling when she was feeling discouraged her learning process process stopped and so to keep that gate open in in curiosity in in joy in this playful and hopeful space she was able to learn and make those pathways through her through her brain, through her learning process, she was able to synthesize the languages, learn how to memorize, and learn how to store all this music within three months. She went back in to those juries to be assessed by the professor. She was a different person. She was a different but, person. And now, now tell us, you know, what you've left out is how long this took you to work with this person to get to this position. We, she was committed, very, very committed to doing everything we said. <laughs> and uh, we worked for three full months. To, <laughs> so you were told then, you, she like, had psychiatrists and doctors saying she would never be able to memorize, that she couldn't do this. And in a yeah. three month period, you had her ready to pass her, yeah. her exams, uh, performance exams. Yeah. Yeah. She was able to stay in the program, and then I had her for uh, a full three years, and I helped her pass all of her exams, build a skill set of her own playing, um, not injure herself because so much of the performance, a lot of a lot of performers get injured based on how they're training. Uh, she never got injured. Her her joy was abundant, and. She had that senior recital and played all of her pieces from memory and presented an incredible speech on how she was able to work through her challenges, specifically with memory, and how she was able to... Was, was that a beginning, or was that a, a confirmation of the process that you, that you take, that you, you, know, you have an, uh, a unique process? Was that a beginning of your process, or did that just cement your process? Yep, I'm thinking, what I'm thinking works, and this, this can help. It was, a, it was a confirmation. I would say the first person that I tested this on was myself. I was also told by doctors I would never memorize. Oh, were you really? You didn't tell me that. And I found a way through the technical building on the side of of the technical regimen, coupled with the therapy and the wonderful 
healing I was having in my mind and in my body. And yes, I was able to present five huge recitals in three years for my doctorate. Is that a lot? See, I, I don't know what a lot is. It is an, an absolutely almost inhuman amount. <laughs> <laughs> on, top, on top of all the other repertoire I was learning for ensembles and orchestra, plus all the academic classes, being a mom, a single mom, and also working. So it was... Yeah, I, I, that is a lot. It worked with me. And then I wanted to know if it could work for other people. Did I just get lucky with my question? And I wanted to definitely not just be lucky. I wanted this to be accessible for everybody, no matter their learning style, no matter what limitations they've been told they've had. If they have the willingness and they're committed to the process, the the, the very, you know, the hard work of, of you know, the six to eight hours a day of training, you know, of the technical side, and they're willing to play with the being side and learn those tools of compassion, they're willing to do that. That's who I work with. That's, you know, that's when I see. What what you're saying reminds me of an of, of a of a situation I know from you know my listeners know that I'm involved in baseball and my son's a professional baseball player, and in, in our your my previous conversations I spoke about ranking amateur baseball players and how the system of ranking the players is an enormous failure. They will take the 100 um, high school, college, and 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 minor league players that are going to make the big leagues and maybe 20 of them make it and and it's never the top 20 it could be number 98 and number 54 you know they don't know it because stephanie what they don't have is they have no way of measuring what i call makeup or the internal development of the athlete and i think this is true of all artists I think, and I think it has something to do with what you call being and doing, and both are absolutely essential that you've got to have, the technical is a given, you've got to have the technical, but there's a boatload of people out there with the technical that are not quote-unquote successful, that don't make their, their goal because there is something about the being part, and you call it the, the regimen and the compassion. And I, I love that you, you find this marriage that you are, you are able to take and say, we need to develop the technical. We need to make sure that we, we know that inside out and we practice it regularly. But there is also this, you know, the healing modalities, the dealing with the invisible giants, with the imposter syndrome, with all sorts of things that the artist has to face. And believe me, as a writer, I, I, you know, I'm in the middle of them right now. I'm, I'm in the middle of invisible giants right now. So I, I get them. And, and, and I, I just think you're integrating synthesizing these two these two different states of being are absolutely essential the one without the other i have known what it feels like to train to the highest my highest capacity and still feel despair and still feel inferior and still feel And so you start off with a losing attitude. Yes. And uh, wondering, is this it? Is this all? And, and, and not being able to even remember the love of the art. That, that three and four year old Stephanie that said, I want to learn violin. I love music. That gets lost because of the the, the traumatic abuses of the industry and and the, the the way it is built and how musicians are assessed and ranked and and, and over time taught perhaps not always explicitly but you know it, it is something that is felt and 
and it's over. I have interviewed so many scores and scores of professional musicians, and this is a theme. And uh, part part of my thesis was what what's this missing link? Why why are the artists not thriving holistically? What what's wrong? Hey, you've <laughs> got something. Passion. Mm-hmm. You have something really strange going on in that you told me that when you interview potential students and potential clients, you don't look at their credentials, nor do you have them practice. You talk to them. And I'm thinking, you got to be kidding me. You're taking musicians. You don't listen to them. You, you don't look at you know who they've played for, where they've played, what they've done. You do it through... It's got to be an intuitive process it's based on a set of standards that you have established that you know what will work and what will not work. I, I find that absolutely amazing that that's the way you, you select your clients. Yes, it's a different metric system. I don't audition my students. I don't require a certain amount of minutes for practice. We build that. I, I look for a, a student who is curious, who is optimistic, who is willing to trust, uh, who is playful, who, you know, these character qualities are, are, are the absolute foundation for, for learning. And, and the older we get, the more, those, the more those are put down. We need some, yes, yes, we, we absolutely do. We have to find them again, create that environment where we can thrive and I will always, I will, I will work with any child and any adult, no matter their learning style or their deficiencies or their training or what, what is needed. I can work with absolutely everybody as long as those, the commitment is there and the desire is there and they're able to be you know, they're able to be taught these tools and then they are willing to play with them. And that, I always tell the students, that process will take for some students three months, for others six months, for others yeah. a year. Usually yeah. after about a year, if a child is still not engaging or willing to synthesize and, and, and really apply themselves, then they're probably not ready or just not a good fit. And that's okay. I just well, you you time. certainly but give them time. Yes, because because it it takes it takes time. But it when it takes a root, and it and a student um, starts to see their own their own success, they own it, and that's when they own the, the learning process. And so they are practicing 30, 45, 60 minutes, two hours, three hours, but they're the ones doing it. They want it. And they, yeah. That's it, brilliant. It's their that's, idea, that's, they, they that's own brilliant. it. And that is like, that can be a three-year-old, that can be a six-year-old, that could be a 63-year-old. And you know, and it, and it, and it, and it comes for professional athletes. It comes for artists of of all sorts, not just musicians. That that we must follow those those precedents. I tell you what I'm going to do. I want to wrap up our conversation, but you have a philosophy that I I can't not talk about. That we can just kind of end with this, but this is really good. And that you you teach your students, you are enough. We're never told that, Stephanie. We're never told you are enough. You, you are not enough. You need to grow. You need to improve. But you are enough. And that you also said we must come to the place of believing you are what you are, not what you feel you are. Now, we could do a whole show on this. This is, this is big. You are what you are in reality, not what you feel you are, because... What you feel you are is so contingent upon the power of those invisible giants. If they're very powerful, then you're going to feel you're incompetent. 
But that doesn't mean you are incompetent. That means you're just feeling it because the voices of negativity are striking so strongly. You are enough is, that is a powerful message, Stephanie. I believe it's 100% true. When I'm working with a student, there are technical aspects that can be learned and refined and built. They, They actually come into the process, into the studio, with without any violin skills so that side of the learning they are acquiring and being fast and refining i never want them to to take that side of the learning and assign it to themselves so if they are not getting a concept in violin they must mean oh there's something wrong with me, or I'm lacking this, and I'm lacking this in my being. I must be this, this, and this. No, 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 no. You, you as an artist, you are enough. You are whole. You are beautiful. You are strong, and you are learning violin. So to mix those two, or for 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 a student to accidentally flip their identity over to their their learning of their regimen can be so dangerous. <laughs> and I regularly remind them, you are enough. I, I you know, I accept you. I, I, I welcome you just as you are. And we're learning violin over here. That is that is so different than any teaching model. Any teaching model, the objective of the teaching model is to show your inadequacies and how to improve your inadequacies. Rather than saying, you are adequate, we just want to add to your skill set. Yes, that is our system. Yes, artistic identity, in my opinion. It is remembering for us older, older humans, we have to remember who we are and and live live from that identity and ultimately create from that identity because that will color that will that aroma will carry into everything we create and I, for the children they'll hopefully never know anything different so that when they're creating they'll i i see i I, I see it. I've, I've been doing this for a full year now in my studio, and I'll hear them coaching themselves. I am calm. I'm compassionate. I can do this. Or I am powerful. I have solutions. And then they'll, they'll play. <laughs> I am enough. If they're believing, I, I see it like this. I say, um, I say, if you, let's see here. I have a wording in my podcast that that I really believe in. And it says, as you say I am enough, or whatever uh, whatever um, word you're gonna put in there, I have 52 I work through with my studio. Enough is just one of 52. As you say I am enough, you will believe you are enough. And as you believe you are enough, you will live like you are enough. And as you live like you are enough, you will become enough. And as you become enough, you will create from enough. Well, I'll tell you what, that's going to be my mantra for the next for the next few days as I'm wrestling with this book, but that but that I believe that I am enough and and I've studied enough, I've done the research, you know, I've I've kind of got a brief outline and that I just have to believe I'm enough and sit down at the damn computer and start typing and and let what happens happen and um and 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 i i so concur so stephanie are are you taking on new clients i i i am taking on teachers who want to be violin teachers who want to be trained in this violin technique method yes i have Okay. Oh, but, but you're not taking on like like art artists. My, my artists that um, enrollment opens in February for the upcoming fall, and then it's filled very quickly. But 
there are always opportunities to study with me as the openings come and also study with my certified teachers that are also loving this way of teaching, learning how to teach it, learning the technical regimen as well as the tools of compassion. And they are fabulous, brilliant teachers. I'm predicting on this show one day you're going to be huge. You know, what you're doing, what you're doing is so unique and so powerful. Um, I will include your a link to your website at violintc.com. I will include that in the show notes and uh, recommend my friends to, um, to get in touch with you. Stephanie Allen, thank you so much for spending time with me today. I mean, it's really been a delight for me chatting with you. I, I have such respect and admiration for what you do. Thank you so much, Charlie. This has been unbelievably fun and enjoyable, and I'm so grateful for this space. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Stephanie. We will um, hang in and we'll chat. So... For everybody, uh, that's all for today. This is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now.